Welcome everyone. Phillips here. Bonus points for anybody who can appreciate my t-shirt. Um, we are going to uh, start the official MIT rule is we start classes five minutes after the hour. Uh, I've updated the course homepage to suggest that people ask questions via Twitter because uh, the registration for this class tripled in the last a uh, few days, and we're not sure that Google Docs is going to be able to handle it. So check the course homepage, and also I'll update the collaboration document to uh, suggest people ask questions by, via Twitter. Tina, you want to add anything to that? Oh, we also, in case anybody can't get in, uh, in case anybody can't get in, we've added a backup session at uh, 5 p.m. every day that I'll host from my personal Zoom room. Tina, can I get a sound check from you? Yes, you have some questions in the Zoom chat as well. Yeah, that's true. Questions in Zoom chat. Eight hundred people. Good lord. <laughs> Okay, here's the moment I've been dreading. The participants, 299. Let's see if it cuts people off at 300. Okay. All right, we got Minakshi in before the limit. I, I, uh, I think that it cut everyone off because it was uh, steadily increasing. Mm. All right, I appreciate uh, some folks are volunteering to go to the backup session. Um, Phil, do you mind sending the backup uh, session information in the Zoom chat? So in case anyone can attend the backup session, um, it'll allow other folks to join right now. Tina, there was a chat. Are you, uh, have you started, you've, you've started the recording, good. Yeah, actually that's by default. Somebody asked about recording and uh, yes, the recordings will be made and posted. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, so unfortunately, as, as we feared, uh, MIT has put a 300 person cap. So if you'll just give me a moment, um, I'll make an announcement to the folks that aren't able to join. Philip, are you adding the backup session information to the Zoom chat? I think I did. I thought I did. Hmm. Oh, it's a direct message. Hold on to everyone. There it goes. Okay, so folks in this room, if you'll just if you'll just bear with me a moment, I'm just going to send an announcement to all the folks that are trying to join who can't join to uh, to let them know. 
Should I start the slides, Tina, while you're doing that? Uh, I just, I have the email ready to go. Just give me one second. Okay. The, well, the first set of slides anyway is the, the responses to the spreadsheet. So if you want, you could share that. Okay. Let me put this on my other screen here. Slideshow in the beginning. Okay, everybody, while well, Tina's uh, occupied with dealing with our popularity, a problem that I've certainly never had to deal with at any time in my life, uh, I will uh, start the slides. Um, here is a kind of a pie chart from last week of who had signed up. And uh, as you see, where it's about half of half MIT folks and half non MITers, which is great. Um, people mostly don't have uh, a lot of aviation experience. It looks like uh, a minority of people have either done one flight lesson or uh, you know, are partway through their private. Um, and it looks like uh, almost everybody wants to earn a pilot certificate. I don't see the drones uh, in here. Maybe we forgot to ask about drones. Sometimes people sign up because they want to get their uh, drone license. Oh, I guess, okay, 32% are most interested in drones. So maybe that's uh, where we have it. Okay, um, here's kind of a list of where people are sitting as they study this. Kazakhstan would be my favorite. I actually was gonna go there with the MIT alumni travel. Uh, we were gonna go there in, uh, to the, all, all five of the stand countries uh, this spring. And not only did they cancel my trip because of COVID, they, uh, I think, killed all of MIT alumni travel. It no longer exists. So uh, that trip and all the others are dead. Okay, so what are the objectives uh, that uh, we have here? We want to prepare you for the um, knowledge test that the FAA gives. And it's available, remember, in uh, multiple variants, none of which are considered better than another. Some people think that, you know, learning to fly in a Cessna is somehow uh, more favored by the FAA than learning to fly in a hot air balloon or a glider or a helicopter, but it's not true. Uh, nobody has to uh, start with a particular kind of aircraft. Um, we're gonna concentrate on airplane, however, um, because that is what most people are interested in. Uh, we will also though prepare you for the drone uh, written test and you'll learn something about uh, helicopters and seaplanes as well. Um, since it's an MIT class, we want to make sure that you understand some of the engineering that uh, goes into these systems. And, uh, you know, flight training is kind of expensive, especially for young people. Um, so we want to make sure that uh, you make get the maximum benefit of, uh, of each hour of your flight training. All right, so what is great about aviation? Um, you know, humans have been dreaming about flying for a long time. Uh, one thing that I love is being up in the air and looking down and being able to see how everything's organized, whether it's the geology of our planet or it's the geography of human settlement. Um, being up in a light aircraft at a fairly low altitude is just the best way to really uh, get all of that. Um, Aviation is also one of the great uh, engineering achievements of our age. You know, if you look at the progress that's been made since the Wright Flyer through to uh, the aircraft of today, um, that's a great journey. And it's been mostly a pretty safe journey, at least for the last uh, 50 or 60 years. Um, we can, uh, another great thing about aviation is oftentimes, you know, especially in the last year, we're sitting here um, on our butts in front of a computer. <laughs> so we're really only using 
you know, one corner of a human capability, right? It's just sort of our mental capabilities. We don't need any physical capability, thank God. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, things don't get too emotional on your average person's uh, Zoom. Uh, but up in the air, you know, you might be a little bit scared because it's not natural to be up in the uh, air. And uh, you do have to work, um, you know, your physical coordination a little bit more carefully than you would typing at a keyboard. Uh, finally, one of the least interesting parts of aviation from my point of view is actually the transportation aspect. You know, if you wanna get places, it's pretty easy to do that in a car. Cars are extremely efficient. Uh, you don't need to spend any extra time training to, uh, to learn how to drive a car. Most people already know how to drive a car. So uh, yes, it's true that if you wanna to go to an island like Martha's Vineyard, uh, having a light aircraft, light aircraft flying as a hobby can actually save you some time. Uh, I don't try to sell people on aviation as a hobby for the transportation part of it. All right, what can you do from here in the Boston area? I'm sure this will be of uh, tremendous interest for the folks who are connecting from Sao Paulo. Uh, we have uh, a bunch of local uh, airports listed up here, in addition to Logan Airport, of course, which is the air carrier airport. We've got uh, airports uh, all around uh, Boston, which we'll show you in a moment. Uh, all of these airports have uh, flight schools where people can take lessons and rent airplanes or helicopters. Uh, one of my passions is to, is to back people off from the goal of getting a private pilot's license as the marker of being a pilot. You know, you can learn to fly in 10 hours. Um, you can take off, you can uh, cruise around, you can land, the instructor can be sitting next to you uh, with arms folded like this and you can do it all. So that's really being a pilot. People get their minds wrapped up in the idea that a pilot means you have an FAA pilot certificate which is a little bit different. That means that you're safe to be the only pilot in the aircraft, that you can handle various kinds of equipment failures, that you can handle being lost, that you can navigate and plan a safe journey from you know, Boston to California. Uh, and that's great, but that's uh, a somewhat different skill than just knowing how to fly an airplane. All right, here's our local area. Uh, so this is an aeronautical chart that uh, you'll learn how to read. Uh, pretty thoroughly in some of the subsequent lectures. Um, you can see uh, in the lower right-hand corner of the screen, Boston. Let me see if I can uh, get, how do I get that laser pointer, the laser pointer up? Tina, how do you get a laser pointer up on uh, PowerPoint? I'm not pointer sure. options, here it is. Oh, I'm... Is that working? Yes, we can see it, Philip. Okay, here's Boston, that's Logan Airport. Um, and here's Hanscom Field, Bedford. That's uh, where I fly out of. Um, here's Beverly, closer to the water, therefore a little bit more subject to fog and bad weather. Lawrence, there's Nashua in New Hampshire. There's Norwood down here, Marshfield's off the chart. Um, here's Hanscom Field, it's got a control tower. You can see the ramp here with all the flight school airplanes um, and some more flight school airplanes. You can see here, actually, if you were at Hampton Field today, you, would, you, will, you will have never seen the airport more packed with Gulf Streams at any time in history. Um, so uh, lockdown is uh, not exactly the same for uh, every uh, social class in the United States. <laughs> Let me tell you, you cannot park your car at Hanscom right now. Uh, you cannot park your Gulf Stream. It is uh, absolutely jammed with uh, folks enduring lockdown in Aspen, Florida, the Caribbean, and Mexico. Um, all right, so that's an airport. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about one trip you can do. As Philip said, this was um, designed with the idea of teaching this course in person as we've done uh, every year previously. And so when we say local, of course, we mean near near MIT, near Cambridge, Massachusetts, but hopefully you can extrapolate and think about how this would work with your local airport. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about a trip we did to Bar Harbor, Maine. And if you go to the next slide, Philip, 
we did this trip with the MIT Flying Club. So as a comparison, uh, we're showing you on Google Maps the drive time. So um, as Philip described, Hanscom Air Force Base is one of the airports close to Boston that many MIT folks fly out of. And if we were to drive from Hanscom up to Bar Harbor, it's showing about four and a half hours, uh, just one way to do that. So you can imagine that you know, going to Bar Harbor is not, not really a reasonable day trip if you wanna spend any reasonable time in Bar Harbor. So this is an example of a type of trip where flying really has an advantage. And as part of the MIT Flying Club, several airplanes took passengers. We took off from Hanscom Air Force Base. We flew along the coast up to Bar Harbor, Maine, and we had plenty of time to actually go hiking. Uh, so next slide, please, Philip. We went hiking around Acadia in Maine, and so this was the group of folks. These are all the folks that went on various small airplanes and we flew up to Bar Harbor, Maine. We had a great time hiking around, we had lunch and then we all flew back uh, all in one single day. And you'll see in this, um, in this example that uh, some of the folks in this picture on the, on the far left, you'll see Minakshi um, and she'll be talking to you in a couple of minutes about her experience. Go ahead, Philip. Okay, so uh, this is an idea that I had for what would it take to, uh, you know, introduce a young person, for example, to all 48 states in a little Cirrus. So this is about uh, only 50 hours of flying time. It's possible to uh, land in all the lower 48 states, uh, do a little bit of sightseeing, and uh, eventually uh, get back to uh, Hanscom Field. So uh, there's a web link there if you've downloaded the PowerPoints, uh, which you should be able to from um, the course homepage. You can follow that link or just uh, Google search for uh, Philip Green Spun 48 State Tour and you'll find it very quickly. Um, so anyway, that's uh, in about three weeks, the whole country can be seen by a little airplane, which is something I enjoy doing. We actually did a November trip. A friend of mine wanted to be dropped off in Bend, Oregon. So we took a turboprop, which is a little better than a Cirrus. We managed to hop to uh, Chicago, uh, Rapid City, South Dakota, thus horrifying everybody here in uh, Massachusetts, where we consider ourselves to be totally COVID free. Um, dropped him off in Bend, took the family, which I had thrown into the back seat down to San Francisco. So the boys got to see the Redwoods. We went to Las Vegas so they could appreciate fine European architecture. Uh, then we made a big, uh, leap over to Bowling Green, Kentucky. They got to see Mammoth Cave National Park. We got stopped and saw uh, my parents, uh, you know, outdoors on their, their, uh, they live in a retirement apartment building, but they're allowed to see visitors uh, out on the patio and back to Boston in about 11 days. So that was a great trip. I wish we'd stayed out a little bit longer. All right. So why are you going to love it? Um, people who have enough time and money uh, to do anything they want to uh, will end up choosing flying. Uh, you meet a lot of interesting people. Um, so here's a, uh, one of the Walton grandsons. So one of the grandsons, I think this is Stuart Walton. He's the grandson of the founder of Walmart. He loves to fly. He could do anything else that he wants to, obviously. The guy never has to work, never has had to work, and has billions of dollars. So he's got a bunch of old warbirds. He's got a P-51 Mustang, maybe a couple of those. Um, it, uh, but you know, even at the lower end of the scale, it's a passion that pulls together uh, people uh, of all ages, uh, all economic situations. You know, there's plenty of low-income people who scrape together enough money to become an instructor, and after that, they don't have to pay for their flying. Uh, and obviously, people from all around the world. It's uh, one thing that unifies uh, folks is the love for flying. Uh, <clears throat> is it safe? A lot of people. Um, you know, have become very risk averse compared to their forebears of 50 or 100 years ago. Just look at a modern car. It's much more protective than uh, a car from the 1950s or 60s uh, or 1930s. But aircraft haven't really uh, changed that much. You know, a Cessna that you, 172 that you buy today is not really any safer than a Cessna 172 that you would have bought in the late 50s. Um, and that concerns people. 
Uh, and people are not wrong. The traveling in a little Cessna or Cirrus or Piper is not as safe as being on JetBlue. Uh, so you might think, well, that's probably because, you know, this little airplane is just uh, an invitation to flying apart and falling apart. So especially a lot of them are getting older, uh, but actually mechanical failure is not what causes people to get into trouble. You know, it's almost always pilot error. Uh, and you might think, well, you know, how am I going to be safer than all these other people who've had problems? Um, the answer is to just be like the airlines. If you really want to be safe, you can do it in these little airplanes uh, with a lot of recurrent training, uh, getting that instrument rating if you're going to leave the uh, local area. Because, um, you know, if you're flying around just for half an hour from your local airport, the weather's probably not going to change. But if you go from uh, Boston to Washington, D.C., uh, and then stay overnight, you could get into some weather that, you know, is less than ideal. Uh, the real key, though, is a two-pilot crew. You can just say the airlines always fly with a two-pilot crew and the pilots back each other up with checklists. So I'm going to do it that way. I'm going to take my friend who's a pilot with me. I'm going to take an instructor uh, with me. I'm just going to operate. Uh, there's nothing that stops you from operating a Cirrus the way that JetBlue operates their uh, Airbuses. Uh, and what if all else fails? Well, some of the latest airplanes, which we'll get into in the systems uh, lecture, if uh, things are going badly, you can reach up and pull the ballistic parachute and the whole airplane will uh, float down under the parachute canopy. All right, who are the instructors? I'll introduce myself uh, for the MITers here. Um, this may be hard to believe, but MIT was in operation in 1982 uh, when I got my bachelor's degree. I've been, um, oh, and actually to get from East Campus to class, it was a big challenge because the Wisconsin Glacier was still covering Massachusetts to a depth of about 100 feet, but we managed to walk over the glacier or tunnel under. Um, all right, I've been a pilot since 2002. I learned at Bedford at East Coast Aero Club, which is where I'm teaching today, uh, both airplanes and helicopters. Uh, I did a little bit of a, a stint as a regional jet pilot for Delta Airlines, so I can answer questions about uh, crew flying and airline uh, practices. Uh, I've got type ratings, which we'll get into later. If you fly a turbojet powered aircraft, you need specific training and a check ride uh, with an FAA examiner that you're qualified to fly that jet and handle emergencies in that jet. Uh, I usually fly the Cirrus SR-20, which we've talked about a little bit. That's famous as the, the little airplane that has the parachute. The Robinson R-44, which is a four seat um, <clears throat> helicopter. The Pilatus PC-12, which was the turboprop airplane I told you about that has about nine seats. And we took that to Oregon and back uh, back in November. Uh, we can You can look on my website. Uh, <clears throat> the best trips in that airplane have been flying sea turtles back to uh, Florida. They get caught in the Gulf Stream. They get washed up in Massachusetts. They decide that they don't like our state uh, income tax and they wanna go back to Florida. So we load them into uh, the PC-12 where they have a temperature controlled environment and we take them back to uh, Florida so they can do the whole thing again the next year. Uh, and I've been flying for about 5,000 hours. All right, so now it's Tina's turn. Hi everyone, I'd like to say welcome again and appreciate your flexibility with the technical difficulties that we've been having with our experiment teaching remote to you. Um, as we said, this is a course that I've taught for about five years, always in person. And this is the first time we're doing a remote experiment and being remote allowed attendance to exceed the, the normal uh, 100 students that we have in person with us every year. And up until Friday of last week, we had about 220 students registered for the class. And then we had a big surge. I'm not sure where our marketing engine came from as we haven't really marketed the course other than MIT course announcements, but uh, we had a big surge and uh, ah, looks like um, from the Zoom chat, everyone says it was posted on Reddit. So that must have been, <laughs> that must have been it because we got about 600 new folks registered and now we have, we've closed the registration. So you can't register anymore. So uh, here's some pictures of me. Actually, the top left one uh, is me at 
Hanscom Air Force Base, where I am still a student pilot in that picture, learning and getting my, so I'm sitting next to my instructor, when two jets, uh, two F-18s uh, came out on the um, taxiway as I was doing my engine run up, one of the really best experiences I've ever had at Hanscom. And they went by the tail numbers Jet 1 and Jet 2. And of course, uh, they went ahead of me. So <laughs> that's a picture where you can see them passing me as I'm doing my engine run up. The other picture is me flying with some of my fellow uh, co-pilots. Uh, as Philip mentioned, it can be a lot safer to fly with other pilots. And Minakshi in a few moments will talk about some of her flying adventures, including flying with some other women pilots in a Women Pilots of New England group we have up here. And so that is an experience I've had. And then of course, jumping out of airplanes. Next slide, Philip. So just more formally, I'm course 16, which is aeronautics and astronautics engineering. Um, as we've pulled our class in the past, many of the MIT students are aero astro, but we have other departments welcome as well. I've also enjoyed flying on a zero gravity flight. So if you're not familiar with that, there is this idea of you could take an airplane, if you can see in my video, I'm holding up an airplane, and the airplane can fly in a parabolic trajectory as if it was a roller coaster. And just like on a roller coaster, when you get to the very top of a roller coaster uh, and kind of pause before you come down, you feel your stomach kind of lift up inside your body. Well, actually, um, if you fly the plane that way, you can take advantage of that top of the parabolic arc to achieve zero gravity or microgravity for about 30 seconds. And you can use that experience to to enjoy zero gravity flight. So I did that as part of MIT to test our satellite that we built as part of the MIT undergraduate satellite program. Um, a lifer at MIT continued on um, doing my master's and PhD. I also served as chief engineer at Raytheon, building large electronic warfare systems and have been very involved in the entrepreneurship world. My previous startup was focused on cybersecurity and secure virtualization um, networking. And we grew that company and sold it to a public company, one of the leaders in networking. And now I'm working on another uh, MIT startup. I've been a pilot since 2012. I'm very excited to be part of the MIT Flying Club and I actually usually fly the, the Cessna 172. While I've flown many other airplanes, I'll say that this is one airplane that's available at every single flight school you go to. The parts are available at every single place because it's a common training aircraft and so it's a good airplane. And then most recently I've been focused on writing a book. So I recently wrote a book called Innovating in a Secret World where I was very focused on the contrast between the world of secret classified government world and the open startup community. And there's a lot of contrast there with regard to innovation. So happy to talk about that further. Next, Philip. Okay. Um, so um, people have already asked in the chat se session, which I've been monitoring here about how the asynchronous is gonna work. So uh, I hope People have uh, done their reading, um, and if they haven't, they can uh, do this already. They can they can uh, do the stuff that we have on the course homepage. Um, so you know you'll have to read this usually about three times before reading taking the FA written exam to really absorb it all. So don't don't worry if you don't get it all. Uh, the asynchronous stuff that we've talked about, Tina, Tina's wondered. Tina has a theory for how that's going to work, but basically, sure. I can tell you that we actually have a couple of slides at the end of the deck, but it's, sometimes it's helpful to hear the information more than once. So let me give it one time here and then one time at the end of the deck, we have some more slides about it. So as, as we've said a few times, this, this class is taught every year in person. Um, it used to be taught as a spring semester class over the course of the full spring semester. And then uh, Philip and I redid the class to be an intensive three-day class, nine to five uh, during IAP, which is the term MIT uses for the January independent activities period. 
during that class, we had a hundred students each year and we were very impressed. You know, we, we start the class about 101 students and despite blizzards and having to wake up at 9 a.m., we finish the class usually with about 98, um, which is pretty impressive. And what is more impressive is the testimonial get in a few minutes from Minakshi. We have many students that have taken our ground school class and then gone on to become pilots, which is really the objective. But now switching to the remote world, um, COVID has introduced a new normal, but as we've experienced that, instead of putting you through uh, you know, death by Zoom and having uh, nine to five of lectures, what we did is we decided to take advantage of something we did a few years ago before COVID. We actually had the, um, the class recorded. And so all of the lectures that we taught in the class in 2019 are already posted online through the MIT Open Courseware or MIT OCW. So what we're going to do is actually only teach one hour a day, which is the hour we're in right now from 11 a.m. Eastern to noon Eastern. Each day we'll have a live session. And during that session, um, we'll teach some material, but mostly focus on reviewing the key concepts from the previous day and answering questions. Then we'll have an asynchronous period, which means on your own, you can go watch the lectures on MIT OpenCourseWare. And we have those um, in, the, in the end of the slide deck, you'll see which lectures we suggest you watch each day. In addition, each day we have an assignment. Now don't get too scared. The purpose of these assignments is not to grade you um, and we have no intention of failing folks in the class. The goal is to get you to learn and become a pilot and understand the knowledge you need to pass your FAA written exam and learn a little bit more. So for example, about 17 of you have already completed assignment number one, which we have posted for today. And it includes some questions such as, what is your local airport? And what does it cost to rent an airplane? And again, the reason for these questions is we'd like you to get out there and learn so that at the end of this course, you can go become a pilot, learn to fly. So we'll be posting assignments each day. And then the final assignment at the end of the week will be a practice FAA written exam. And if you successfully pass, now again, you can take this, this exam as many times as you need to until you pass, uh, passing score is 70 or above. But once you pass that FAA written exam, you can post your result to a link that we'll show. And uh, Philip, who is a CFI, will actually give you an endorsement to take the actual FAA written exam. Now, some of these terms like endorsement and written exam will be defined in the course material, but we're just using them to give you an overview. So again, at the end of this course, you will be able to take the actual FAA written exam and get a certification, which will help put you to, on your path to becoming a pilot. But without further ado, Philip, let's have uh, the next slides where Minakshi will give them an inspirational story as to why they should put up with all of this. Okay, just a, there's a couple more uh, bureaucratic slides. So you're gonna do all this reading, I hope. Um, the FAA books are actually quite clear and they get better all the time. Uh, and they're all free in PDF, which is why we've selected them. Uh, optionally, some people have textbooks that other people have written like Jeppesen, the Boeing uh, subsidiary or um, other publishers. We don't think that they're necessary, especially uh, if you're uh, you know, an MIT a type who's good at reading uh, stuff that's in books. Uh, the FAR AIM is good in a book. It's a big, thick one. Um, that's also free online. The Federal Aviation Regulations and the Aeronautical Information Manual. Um, most uh, flying students will buy a copy of that because it's free. You know, the printed book is you're just paying for printing, which is about 20 bucks. Uh, you can also get that as an app, which I have. Uh, test prep books. So these are. Uh, you know, you, at the end of this class, you'll be using the King School's private pilot uh, test, sample tests, but there's all these books that will help you prepare for the tests. If you're, if you're not a good test taker, those are worth having. And then there's the Airman Certification Standards, which uh, again are free online, uh, also available as little books. And that tells you what the examiner on your private pilot check ride will be looking to see that you actually do in the aircraft. Um, 
noise canceling headsets. I happen to think Bose are the best now. I've had three out of four of my light speed headsets fail recently, which is pretty annoying. So uh, if you can afford it, a thousand dollar Bose uh, noise canceling headset is a good luxury that will make your uh, flying uh, more pleasant. You can buy those uh, online or uh, oftentimes at the front desk of a local flight school. All right, so to get your private pilots- Just to clarify on the headsets though, they're usually available for free uh, for your first couple lessons at the flight school. So you don't have to buy these things in advance of your first couple lessons. That's true, good point. Um, yeah, we have them for the helicopters because they have a different connector and they're a little weird. So the flight training helicopters, uh, we just have headsets in them. It's good for exchanging COVID germs with your fellow uh, customers. All right, uh, to get a certificate, uh, colloquially referred to as a license, you do the flight training, uh, you apply uh, to get a student pilot certificate, um, and then you take a third class medical exam with a physician, uh, an FAA designated physician. This may be your only third class medical exam ever. After that, you can do everything with your regular doctor if you want. Um, we'll talk about that in a later uh, lecture. Um, basically, the FAA wants to make sure that you're not going to, uh, you know, drop dead in the middle of your uh, first solo flight. So in order to be the only um, pilot in the aircraft, which is what you will be when you're solo, uh, you need that medical certificate. Um, when you're flying with the instructor, the instructor has a medical certificate. So the FAA is pretty certain that, uh, you know, at least one of you is going to survive long enough to get the airplane back on the ground. Um, you will take the knowledge exam, which is, of course, what this uh, class is preparing you for. Uh, that's pretty, uh, you know, it, that's not that's not one of the big gates. Obviously, the uh, the hardest thing to do is to learn how to fly well enough to uh, pass the practical test. Uh, and then that practical test has an oral section, maybe lasting 45 minutes or so, where the examiner asks you hypothetical questions, questions about the systems of the airplane. You know, uh, how many alternators does it have? What happens if the alternator fails? Uh, how long do you have? What systems can you shut down? Um, you know, is it legal to fly the airplane upside down or not? You know, that varies on the aircraft. Um, and then, uh, you know, a 45, probably about a 45 minute in the air flight, uh, one hour maybe from engine start to engine shutdown. Okay. Uh, yeah, and the Mark, private... Let me just respond. There, there are a lot of, uh... There's a lot of comments going in the Zoom group chat. Um, I won't be able to respond to them all, but I will caution you. Uh, all these questions that have to do with, um, you know, how long does the endorsement last? What are the requirements? Um, many of these questions are actually required for you to know in order to take the FAA written exam. So the answers to these questions are actually part of the 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 FAR, which we'll get into. So rather than take the guidance from, from your peers on, uh, on Reddit or in chats, please know you can actually get the real, the real answers uh, from the FAA regulations, which you're required to know anyway in order to pass the FAA written exam. Okay, here we go. Now it's time to hear from somebody uh, who's a lot more interesting than uh, and me, maybe not more interesting than Tina. Manakshi, are you unmuted? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Um, Phil, do you mind if I quickly share my screen? No, not at all. Okay, can you can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I am Manakshi. I'm uh, a PhD student studying neuroscience at Harvard. So mostly studying brains, uh, but when I'm not, I also fly planes, enjoy most things, adventures. And that's how I got into flying. So I was first uh, flying as a passenger uh, with MIT Flying Club. So in normal times, um, the, the club is really active. They hold a lot of flyouts and I flew as a passenger uh, with Philip to Chatham on a fly out to Republic Airport in Long Island and um, also uh, in the, the fly out to Bar Harbor that Tina was talking about. And of course, um, I really enjoyed it, but then I came with um, zero aero background. So 
um, it was definitely like just this course that uh, really enabled me to become a pilot, even though like I flew and then I realized I was interested in it, but uh, the, this course was what laid the foundation for uh, the rest of my aviation experience. So literally, like I remember asking a friend um, how planes fly and he brought up this uh, graphic and uh, that, that was all I knew. And then um, and then end of the course, I was able to give the FAA knowledge test. And, and even today, a lot of people ask me like from neuroscience, how are you even a pilot? And I always point them to this course. So this, this course like, really made all the difference to me. And um, so, uh, yeah, so after the course, I um, took the, I took my lessons over the summer. Uh, so my two years of grad school stipend was put to good use. And uh, so here on the left, you can see that's my first solo. I was very excited. Uh, and yeah, so end of that summer, uh, I got my uh, private pilot's license um, and so now it's been, yeah, it's been two years, three years feels like it's been uh, decades now, but um, but after after PPL, like Philip said, there are a lot of things you can do depending on um, what you want to do, like um, getting uh, an instrument license as an, as an option. And I just, um, we're still flying, was just planning to still fly mostly locally. So I wanted to get uh, spin training. And then I also wanted to see what it feels like to not just fly, fly straight in levels. So I took some aerobatic lessons um, uh, also at East Coast. So I, I fly out of Hanscom. And uh, and then mostly I've been flying with the MIT Flying Club. So the, the same New York Skyline route to Republic, which I did as a passenger, I ended up doing it as a pilot, taking passengers. Um, that was really nice. Um, yeah, flying 200 feet over Hudson, talking to Kennedy Tower. Uh, it was a very beautiful flight. Also flew to Chatham as a as a pilot. And like Philip said, it's it's um, always really nice um, when you also have it's like when it's like a two pilot crew. You all, as I flew with uh, Smitha, who's also a part of the the women uh, women pilots of New England group, and she's also an instructor at uh, East Coast. And we took passengers and went for Chatham Airport's um, open house, and it's a really beautiful airport in Cape Cod. And yeah, and um, and the women pilots of New England group is also a really nice, very active group. We hold flyouts and we also meet and um, talk most aviation-related things. And we also used to host like um, aviation-themed Secret Santa, um, all of that before COVID. But I also see several members, uh, Ellen and Kristen and others are on the uh, in the class today. So if you're interested uh, in joining, let me know. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, definitely highly recommend that. And um, been flying friends, did the Boston City tour, which is a lot of fun. Also took my mom, she was super terrified, but <laughs> she ended up trusting me and then um, I've also been learning from the backseat. I've been flying with uh, with Philip. We, it's also kind of insane how much you can do in a day. Like like Tina said, just like Bar Harbor, we ended up doing. Uh, went to Niagara, did Made of the Mist, and came back um, all in one day. And also by learning from the backseat, which is really nice. And um, like Phil's shirt, um, it's a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun going to Oshkosh. Is one of the the biggest uh, general aviation um, air venture. Uh, and yeah, it ends up being the world's busiest control tower those few days. Uh, so yeah, there's so much you can do. And um, yeah, I'm here, I'm um, a very good example for how you can go from really like having no aero astro background to really learning all you need to learn uh, in this course and, and um, taking away a lot of beautiful experiences. And there's also something really like really challenging and rewarding to learn from every single experience. And of course the community, the MIT Flying Club, the women's um, pilot of New England group and, and just amazing instructors and, um, and all of their fellow um, pilots um, and aviation enthusiasts, it's an amazing community. So of course, like there's no reason to not love it. So uh, yeah. Well, it's a just plain people with a special air on them. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks, Phil and Tina. Thanks.
Sounds great. So if I can share if that works for you. Okay. Oh, and while Tina's doing that, let me remind you that people worldwide regard Harvard University as the finest institution of uh, higher education, learning and research that's in uh, West Cambridge. Philip needs to make up for the slights he gives for other universities. <laughs> I, I always say that MIT is regarded by people worldwide as the finest uh, engineering and science school in East Cambridge. Thanks, Manakshi. I really appreciated that uh, testimonial. So I think uh, if it wasn't already obvious, the message is you too can go on to become a pilot after taking this course. And we hope you do. We are always uh, find it rewarding to hear the stories of you um, sharing, you know, when you get your solo, when you get your PPL, uh, it's very rewarding for us. So on to some of the technical details. So the FAA written exam, we've, we've mentioned this a few times. Um, so this is a, you know, one of the things that you have to do in the course of getting your private pilot license is in addition to showing proficiency in the airplane, you have to have some, some knowledge. And that's really what we're gonna cover the content in this course. And so it's a computer-based multiple choice test. Most people don't uh, need the full two and a half hours, so I don't think the time constraint is the biggest issue. There are 60 questions, and we'll be going through some sample questions um, today and throughout the course. So passing is a 70, and uh, if you <laughs> Uh, Philip has offered in the past to buy you lunch. I'm not sure how he'll do that virtually, but basically we, we feel very confident that if you do the reading, if you uh, watch the lectures, if you take the practice exam and pass, we feel confident you will pass the actual FAA written exam, uh, so much so that Philip will buy you lunch if you don't. So to get the most out of class, Again, as Philip said, the reading is very helpful. There's only so much uh, we can teach live, even in the open courseware lectures. So please take a look at the, the books. A lot of the FAA questions draw from the books. We've given some references to test prep books. Some folks don't need those. There are a lot of uh, references online. A few people in the chat have mentioned AOPA. So um, Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, it's a great, resource and um, you can actually get a free six month student membership. They'll send you their magazine, it has useful information um, and their overall community can be very helpful. So in terms of this class, um, again, the testing and grading is most relevant um, for the uh, less than about a hundred of you who are registered through MIT to officially take the course. Uh, for the rest of you, um, I think the, the real thing is that if you, if you complete the practice exam in a passing score, Philip will give you the endorsement. So you don't need to worry about the grade you get here. Um, but here, you know, in terms of the, the credit, it is a three unit course at MIT. We'd like you to attend. As we've seen through Zoom, there are a lot of attendance issues. In fact, uh, we got cut off at 300 participants. So we'll have to, um, you know, allow you to watch recordings instead. We will have a daily assignment. So there'll be five assignments. If you complete all those assignments, you'll be good to go. And the main, the main objective is to score a 70 on the final. Uh, we've gotten the question about 15 times uh, on the chat today, which is, will we extend the deadline for when you submit the, the daily assignments? Because some folks will be attending Philip's uh, backup session. Um, if you have to if you have to submit the daily assignment late, you know, it's better to submit it late than not at all. But uh, the reason for the deadline is just so that Philip and I have enough time to actually review the assign the assignments each day so we can um, quote unquote they're ungraded. So we're not going to give you a grade, but we need to know what the proficiency is. So that way we can assess if people are weak in certain areas versus another after reviewing the lectures so that we can decide the next morning whether to uh, emphasize those materials or not. So that's why we have that, that deadline there. I don't think you'll miss too much. Um, you can again, continue to watch the videos on OpenCourseWare. And then I would like to make a point that uh, 
Philip likes to add. So uh, although I'm coming to you as an Aero Astro major and an MIT PhD, that is not a requirement for getting your private pilot's license. So uh, Aero Astro majors, keep in mind that the FAA has designed this material such that people as young as 16 without any technical or scientific training can get their pilot's license. So please don't be intimidated. If things look technical, just spend a little time with it and uh, we're confident you'll be able to overcome. So here is an example. Again, you haven't been taught this material yet, but we just wanna show you an example FAA question. So here's the question. I'll give you a chance to read that. Tina, maybe people can um, they can shout out the answers like with hand signals, like A. <laughs> well, we have a bunch of folks in the chat, and uh, it looks like, at least from the chat right now, it's kind of unanimous around uh, C being the answer. <laughs> so you guys are correct. So good job, everybody there. So now these are the slides that we, we were referring to to talk about the logistics because we have less than 10 minutes left of the class. So let me, let me come back to logistics to make sure we address them. So every day for the next, uh, you know, for this full, full week, Monday through Friday, we'll have this one hour live session like we did just now. And it'll be this Zoom link. And we're, we've already reached out to MIT to extend the um, participation cap so we can allow uh, all those folks that are trying to attend who weren't able to get in to get in. And there's this uh, document. I recommend you save this URL because this URL uh, links you to the latest information of the Zoom link, but also each of the assignment links, the daily assignment. So the daily assignment for today that is linked to from that document. And every day we will add the assignment for the next day. Okay, so here is the, the asynchronous lecture. So basically, as we said, in 2019, we had video recordings done of the live class that we ta taught at MIT. And those lectures, including the PowerPoints, are posted to MIT OpenCourseWare. So you can look at them right now. And this is our recommendation for how you do uh, the class this, this week. So today is day one. And we want you to, uh, you know, these lectures are very focused on how airplanes fly, which is my favorite subject, aerodynamics, um, and how airplanes work. And so these four lectures, lecture two, three, um, four, and 12, are the ones that we recommend you watch today. And, and hopefully that should only take about uh, two, two and a half hours. So sometime during the day, uh, please take a look at those lectures and complete assignment number one. And you can see how it goes. Now I'm gonna attempt to do a, a quick poll here. So I've launched a Zoom poll. And the question is, have you already started watching one or more lecture on MIT OpenCourseWare? So let me just give a few minutes for you to answer that question. Okay, only about, uh, we've got 250 responses. We're waiting for just a few more responses. Okay, now I'm gonna end the polling. So it looks like most of you have not start, can you guys, okay, here we go, share results. So most of you have not yet started uh, watching the course, but over a hundred of you have. So, um, that's great information to understand. So for those who haven't yet, it's very, it's very simple. You should just be able to uh, go to this link and, and watch those lectures. Yeah, they're, they're also linked from the course homepage. There's the, the same exact lectures are on YouTube as well, if that's more convenient for you somehow, or you wanna use Chromecast. So today, um, please take a look at these four lectures, and then you can see that tomorrow is really focused on the flight environment, charts, airspace, navigation. Um, Wednesday will be focused on weather, and the assignment for that day is actually focused on 
you determining the weather at uh, Hanscom that day. So um, I think that will be a good one. Day four is about humans. As Philip pointed out, uh, you are sometimes the weakest link in the airplane. And so we talk a lot about human factors, uh, weight and balance. We'll have you do a specific weight and balance it, um, exercise. And then the final day, we'll kind of tie it all together. And the assignment on the final day, again, is that practice FAA written exam, which you can take as many times as you need, but hopefully you'll be able to pass the first time around. And then there's some special lectures uh, that you can watch at your own time. They're not actually part of the FAA course material. Um, so we have some assignments. Uh, and let's, let's just kind of end here with sort of welcoming welcoming you again um, to our community of aviators. One of the most important things, as Philip said, is flying with other folks, brainstorming with other folks. So we hope uh, to generate and foster a community of aviators. We'd like to thank you for participating in this virtual experiment. The experiment itself has changed dramatically in the last few days going from about 200 to 800 uh, participants. So we went from being in a position where we felt confident that Philip and I could answer each of your questions to now being quite wary of that. I have about, uh, um, you know, about 400 emails uh, in my inbox. So if you don't get a response, uh, please understand that it's just a, a high volume <laughs> for us to be able to answer each of your questions. But hopefully today we answered several of those. Uh, um, Philip, anything else to add? Yeah, I think we could, uh, you wanna go to the next page? Um, so I think we can, these are some of my pictures from, uh, God, where was that? Maybe the, uh, the Reno Air Races, the Blue Angel showed up. Um, I think we can take some questions actually. How about this? People can put them into the uh, chat window and then Tina and I can answer them in real time for a little bit, just so that we actually have some advantage of this. People I see right now are also discussing which chat server to use. Can non-MIT students transfer the credit? I have no idea. We need, we need an, a 400, thousand dollar year academic administrator well uh, um no unfortunately the way that you can get mit credit is either to register through the mit registrar or to cross register which is available to certain students at mit wellesley and a couple other universities so the question is will we get an email for the class daily um yes i planned to send the assignment link out daily because um I didn't want to post all the assignments initially, especially the weather one is really dependent on the weather that day. <laughs> so we wanted to wait. Yeah, there's a question about color deficiency test for class three medical. I think there is some kind of color blindness test, but I think you can wave out of it somehow. We actually have a specific slide on that question um, that is in the Q&A. So you will see that slide posted in the PowerPoints that we have already um, on OCW. Yeah, so Martin asks, so the flight tests in the US and Europe very different. The actual in the aircraft tests are not very different. Um, for helicopters, there's a little bit different. Even private pilots before they solo and during the test, they want them to turn off the engine and do an auto rotation all the way to the ground, sliding it on uh, to the skids, whereas the US doesn't do that. But for airplanes, it's pretty much the same. The main difference between US and Europe is that the Europeans love book learning and paperwork, and they just put people through a lot more knowledge tests. The knowledge tests, uh, you know, they, they, you could have five or 10 different ones. Um, European medicals, I don't think they're very different. Will we review emergency procedures such as engine failure? Um, I don't think so. That's more of an in-airplane thing that you'll do as your actual uh, flight training. How do you pull into an airport to use the bathroom and hit the snack machine? That's perfect. Um, you don't need to file a flight plan. You don't even need to have a radio in your airplane for most airports. You just show up, enter the pattern in a conventional manner. You land, uh, if the airports are expecting, you know, business aircraft like jets, they'll have a wonderful uh, FBO, it's called a fixed based operator, uh, that'll have free snacks and drinks and coffee and all kinds of great stuff. Uh, so yes, it's very practical to fly from Boston to California with no flight plan. Um, 
And, uh, you know, if you have a radio in your airplane, you'll make calls on the radio. And if there's a control tower, you'll get sequenced by the control tower. Um, there's a related question, which is the cost, such as going to Bar Harbor. I think that's a pretty relevant question. Uh, let me answer the cost in a couple different ways. So to, um, to get your private pilot license, um, you know, this ground school course is completely free to you. So hopefully you won't have to pay uh, anything to get uh, prepared to take that course. All of the books are available free and we've linked the PDFs. In terms of the in-person lessons, you need a minimum of 40 flight hours. Most people take somewhere around 50 flight hours with an instructor. And so the question is the cost of the instructor time and the cost of the aircraft. In fact, figuring out that cost for your local flight school is part of the assignment one for today. So I would like to encourage you to do that. But as a total, um, it, just as a data point, it cost me uh, $12,000 to get my private pilot's license, which is pretty expensive, I understand. Um, but as Philip said, you don't have to do the whole thing uh, right away. Um, just 10 hours can get you in a position where you can take off and land uh, the aircraft uh, completely without your instructor touching the controls and that can be much more affordable. And so I recommend getting up there and for just about $200, you can take a discovery flight. So a first flight with an instructor, uh, they usually call it a discovery flight. So it allows you to, uh, without any prior experience, go up and fly an airplane. And then in terms of the specific question about Bar Harbor, um, it cost me for the Cessna 172 rental about $150 an hour. And they charge you by engine hours, so not the whole time that you have the airplane, but the time that you're flying it. And that includes the cost of fuel. So to go to Bar Harbor and back was about two hours each way. So um, 150 times four. And usually, um, depending on who you're flying with, it might be possible for you to split the costs of that flight with your passengers and your co-pilot. Um, but you cannot get paid to fly. So you have to, you have to pay your fair share as the pilot unless you get your commercial flight rating. Yeah, some people also asked, uh, what happens when you get to the destination airport? Can you rent a car at a little tiny airport somewhere? Uh, usually they actually have a free car, a, a courtesy car, or a crew car if you just need to go out for lunch or something and come back. Uh, and then also if you, um, you know, even the small airports of, of which there are thousands in the United States, usually they'll have Hertz uh, cars there or Enterprise will drop a car off. So it is usually possible to find some ground transportation. Uber obviously changed um, the uh, util practical utility of aviation. You know, I'll go to the Gaithersburg airport in Montgomery County, Maryland. And then, uh, you know, as I'm uh, parking the airplane, I'll uh, just call an Uber and, and jump right in. People also, also ask- how of destinations, Philip, that, uh, you know, don't require you to have a car. So for example, um, around New England, um, if, you fly, if you fly to, um, uh, for example, Provincetown, there are some great things you can walk to once you land. Uh, same with uh, Martha's Vineyard. On Martha's Vineyard Island, in addition to Martha's Vineyard Airport, there's also an airport called Katema, which is a grass airport. It's actually like a farm with well-maintained grass strips. And if you land there, there's a cute little airport. There's also a beach. So you can just land your airplane, go to the beach, have some lunch, uh, and, and come back as a day trip. And it's, it's really quite fun. Yeah, somebody asked whether people take knowledge, the knowledge test before starting flight lessons. I think for maximum efficiency, you'll learn all the ground material um, and take the knowledge test before you even start, but that's not necessary or conventional. I think the typical person will be halfway through private pilot training before actually taking the knowledge test, just as it happens. Um, so actually, here's a question um, for people, some people who live, there's somebody from France who asks whether it's possible to take lessons in the US uh, and then credit them back to flight training in Europe. A lot of people do that. There's a ICAO, International Civil Aviation Organization, I think. So basically a lot of experience can be transferred from one country to another. I'm not 100% clear on all the details, but basically if you take uh, lessons in Panama in a helicopter with a Panamanian instructor, uh, you can credit that uh, to uh, your U.S. 
uh, training because they're both ICAO uh, countries. Is East Coast Aero Club part of Hanscom? Hanscom Field is a civilian airport owned by Massport. Hanscom Air Force Base is a little different. Um, they don't have any actually based Air Force aircraft. They just do paperwork there uh, and desk work. So uh, East Coast Aero Club is an independent private company. There's also Mike Goulian, uh, the great aerobatic champion. He has a flight school at Hanscom. So the flight schools in Hanscom generally are distinct from the Air Force, though the Air Force has its own flying club called the, uh, confusingly, the Hanscom Aero Club. So there's East Coast Aero Club and the Hanscom Aero, Aero Club. Um, there is a question that does your discovery flight uh, count towards your flight hours? Yes, it does. In fact, the end of your discovery flight, they will um, they can actually add that flight to your logbook if you already have one, or they can write it on a separate card and then you can transfer it into your logbook once you get one. So even your discovery flight uh, flight hours do count towards your FAA license. Yeah, somebody from India asks whether if you get a private pilot license in the US, is that good globally? Yes, it is in the sense that if you get your private pilot in the US, you can take uh, an airplane, uh, a Cirrus actually can make it from Hanscom Field all the way to India without any modifications. Um, you might have to plan it a little bit carefully to make sure you don't have to land in the Atlantic Ocean, but um, you actually have enough uh, range to make it to Greenland and Iceland and Europe. And that's perfectly legal to fly anywhere in the world in a US registered airplane uh, if you want to use your U.S. license to go fly around in England, there's, it's possible to do that. depends on the country. But generally speaking, if you want to uh, fly in France in a French re registered airplane or in India in an India registered airplane, then you have to convert your license, which typically will take a few hours of uh, maybe some book work and a practical, another practical test. Um, but for, um, for New England, um, one of the easiest destinations is Canada. And um, to go to Canada, you only need to pay $60 to get a radio license, and that allows you to fly in Canada. And a question, related question, do towers speak English globally? Yes, English is the language of aviation. Um, now, well, yes, if you go it's to- officially, It's officially the language of aviation. <laughs> now, of course, uh, you might have local airports that you know, it, strong accents and, and whatnot, but um, officially if, it is the global language of aviation. If you go to Argentina, like south of Buenos Aires, you really have to speak Spanish. If you're in Israel, they have one air, international airport, Ben Gurion in Tel Aviv. I guess it's technically not really in Tel Aviv, but anyway, they have one international airport where you can speak English. But if you wanna fly a Cessna from the little airports, you must speak Hebrew. The controllers are uh, military guys. They don't speak uh, English. Russia has similar rules. You know, if you want to fly into an air carrier airport, English is fine. Um, but uh, yeah, there's uh, if you're if you're on an instrument flight plan, generally speaking, you can get around with English, um, except probably in like Eastern Russia. Uh, and Southern related Russia. a related comment, though, just to clarify. Not every airport has a tower. In fact, this might scare you. This scared the pants off of me. You can actually fly an airplane legally in the US without having a radio, without speaking to anyone. Um, you, can, you can take off from certain types of airports such as you know, private landing strips or certain airports that don't require communication with a controller. You can take off and fly in certain areas and land at other airports without filing a flight plan or speaking to anyone. And you can see some old World War II airplanes where they do that, where they don't even have uh, communications. So it's kind of scary, but it is possible and even does happen in, in New England. Um, yeah, are paper logbooks still used? Sure, you can use a paper logbook or an Excel spreadsheet or an app. It doesn't really matter. Um, but paper logbooks are actually preferred, I think, in uh, Asia. They don't really buy into this electronic stuff. Um, Some folks asked, use both. So I use a paper logbook, which has all the endorsements in it. It's a great place to keep all your endorsements. But then an electronic logbook is helpful to kind of tally up. Um, Matthew from rural Montana wants to know if you can make a private landing strip. Absolutely, there's a whole big FAA book on that. You know, basically they want to make sure that you have 
uh, a nice clear approach path uh, from the two sides of your runway. So that's really what all the certification is about, is making sure that you're not gonna hit an obstacle if you fly a fairly normal uh, angle in or out of your private airport. Uh, that, that's beyond the scope of this class though. Um, but I, I think we got one approved from a friend of mine up in Maine. He, he's been uh, suffering through, hashtag all, all in this together. He's got about 50 acres of oceanfront um, and we helped him get an FAA approved uh, landing site, I think for helicopters. There's a question that uh, from Claudia, who's going to take her check ride. She's already done her written and wants to prep for the oral portion of the check ride. Uh, sure, all of the questions um, and all this material is fair game for the oral portion of the FAA exam, but I'll caution you that generally the um, examiner will go to the area where they think you're least prepared. So me being an aerospace engineer, I was obviously very excited about how the airplane worked and the airplane aerodynamics. And I was excited about questions like that. And the instructor obviously knew that. And so very quickly uh, changed the questioning to, um, you know, the memorization part, such as what is the visibility um, in, you know, requirement in class Bravo airspace and those types of things. So they, they might jump around. Uh, they might ask you about engine failures. They might ask you a question about, you know, cross country flight and avoiding terrain. So yes, Definitely this material is fair game for the oral portion, but they they might think wherever you're most prepared, they'll go to another area. All right, I think I'm gonna decide that John is my favorite student here um, and for the whole class because he wants to do his basic primary flight training at Logan Airport. Um, and I think we're gonna cover this. Of the class Bravo Airport, some of them are ex specifically excluded from student pilots and Logan, Logan Airport happens to be one of them. Uh, however, if you want to take your flight training at a class Bravo airport, Salt Lake City, I believe, is the only one that I can think of that actually does not only welcome student pilots, some of the other ones do, but they uh, have a flight school that's actually on the field. Um, so Logan is a big no, but Salt Lake City is a yes. And I admire your, um, I admire your ambition. Yes, yeah, sometimes you might actually find it a little easier to learn how to fly at a smaller airport because you don't have to contend with large, scary airplanes flying around that are very fast. Um, one time a friend of mine was landing at the JFK airport, which uh, at the time did not have landing fees. And so he was flying a Cessna 172 landing at New York's JFK airport with, you know, New York uh, air traffic controllers. And he was, you know, getting ready for his flight approach and all these jets were having to wait because he's so slow. And so he asked what speed he should have on his approach. And the air traffic controller said, you pedal that thing as fast as you can. <laughs> In fact, the air, the runway is so long, he could actually, you know, really be going as fast as he could uh, all the way through crossing the runway threshold before he had to configure his airplane for landing. And he landed still in the middle of the runway with plenty of runway left ahead of him. And then he had to slowly taxi <laughs> down the runway uh, until he turned off where he needed to go. So you can frustrate some large, uh, large airport controllers by doing that. So we're gonna just take about two, two more questions and then we're gonna go to this asynchronous process. So I will be asking in two minutes for a volunteer who would like to take over as the host of this Zoom meeting in order to start watching those uh, lectures on MIT OpenCourseWare, the first one being aerodynamics. And we'll stay on to make sure you figure out how to uh, transmit your audio. This is just an optional uh, idea if you wanna watch the lectures together and have the chat going so you can do it kind of a community uh, or orientation. It looks like we already have some volunteers for that. Uh, Nicholas, we'll, we'll hand it over to you in two minutes, but uh, any more questions before we wrap up today? Thoughts on flight schools in Alaska? Well, actually Alaska is very interesting as it's a requirement in Alaska that as part of your flight training, you learn how to land on an actual road um, because the airports are spread out and there aren't a lot of places to land. So they actually teach you how to land on a road, uh, which you could do, of course, if you had an engine failure in other parts of the country. But I think it's funny in Alaska that that's actually part of the, the core requirement. 
Yeah, generally, I think I don't, I don't have a specific, I've done a lot of flying in Alaska or a fair amount of flying in Alaska. I think you can just go up to, you know, Merrill, Merrill Field, I believe it is, the big GA field in Anchorage and, and ask around. I mean, that's, we're, we're going to talk about that at the, uh, I think in the last lecture, but the, the way to pick a flight school is to fly with about three different, it's more about the instructor than the school, fly with three different instructors, see uh, which one is, uh, best able to talk you through maneuvers rather than, you know, demonstrating maneuvers, you know, the best instructor uh, can work with his or her arms folded and talk you through how to do things, you know, bring the nose up a little bit, please, or add a little bit of power or whatever, whatever instead of um, having to sort of intervene physically. Um, so I think Alaska is going to be no different. You'll have to uh, fly with different people and see who's able to, uh, talk you through uh, getting the aircraft where it needs to be. There is a question on safely practicing engine out landings. So one thing, uh, one thing that you'll learn about is if you have an engine failure at various points in time, you know, how you handle that. And uh, just a requirement to learn, you know, an engine failure on the runway, basically you pull back power, apply brakes, um, an engine failure while you're, you know, flying around at altitude. Um, if you have enough time, you kind of pitch uh, to the to the right, you know, airspeed so that you can have the most time to handle the issue. Then you focus on restarting your engine or looking for a safe place to land. Well, a very difficult part is if you have an engine failure right after takeoff, and there's a question about whether you should land ahead of you, you know, or if you should try to turn back to the airport you just took off from. And so one way to kind of practice that very difficult issue of making you know, that decision, how, how much altitude do you need in order to successfully turn back and land? Well, one thing you can do, and you probably wanna to talk to your air traffic controller to let them know what you're doing, is that when you're doing your normal traffic pattern, if you've cleared it with your air traffic controller that you have the ability to do this, when you are flying your traffic pattern, um, you, you usually fly alongside the runway. So you have the runway off, let's say to the left, it could be left or right, but in this case, it's on the left. And when you cross the numbers and you're going away from the runway, it's called, um, called being a beam the numbers. So you can actually pull your engine to idle right when you're a beam the numbers and practice that 180 degree turn to see if you can land. I've done that a few times. And of course your, your engine is there so you can feel free to add power, do a go around as needed, but it's a great way to practice that engine out scenario. All right, so at this point, I have turned the host control over to Nicholas. So Nicholas, uh, when you want, uh, when you can, you can take um, take control and you can pull up the MIT Open courseware and share your screen, and we can start the first uh, lecture video, which is aerodynamics. Okay, so give me just one second. I'm trying to navigate through my emails. Okay, and I, can... I I found it. Okay, great. All right. So let's see, you should all, all right, do you see my screen? 